Hello. Uh, thank you all for um, hanging around and not disappearing into Amsterdam this afternoon. Um, my name's Jamie. I'm here to talk about internet scale product visualization and customization. Um, I work for a company in the UK uh, called LiveLink Technology. We're based in Portsmouth on the very, very south coast of the country. Um, we offer websites that deliver our clients solutions to allow their customers to create a large range of photo gift products. Um, literally anything you can put a photo on it, we have probably done it from normal things like canvases, um, books, all the stuff you expect through to acrylic blocks where people are firing lasers in the middle to make a three-dimensional variation of your image. Um, my team, um, I'm very, very fortunate to work with an incredibly talented and creative team uh, within my department. Um, we've got two-dimensional artists, three-dimensional artists, scripting capability. We sit as part of our entire company of about 90 people. Um, we've got web developers, system engineers. Um, it's a fairly large operation. Um, my team, though, provide static, on-demand, and interactive visuals, um, things like JPEGs, or um, uh, occasionally, in certain terms, it's GLTF files we get to. But I'll get to that later. Um, it's an in-house developed solution. Um, we currently focus on providing for web and mWeb. And in the past, we've worked on app and also in-store touchscreen kiosks. Uh, the company was pretty much founded on touchscreen kiosks. Um, but like everyone in the world, we're really prioritizing web at the moment. Here's um, a couple of examples of the sites we work with and we run. Um, you may have heard of Walmart. If anyone's from the States, um, you will definitely have heard of Walmart. Um, in the UK, we work with uh, Asda Photo and also Costco Photo in the UK. Um, these are the kind of main pages of the sites. Both of these feature either a combination of um, photography and 3D renders, mainly the 3D renders, as the photo, Costco, and nearly all 3D render. Uh, the Walmart one's far of a, it's a more balanced mix. Uh, we work with our in-house team, and we also use work provided to us by designers in the States. The challenge to us, um, working with clients like that, they're very big clients, and anyone who's worked in retail will tell you retailers are demanding. They have to meet what their customer wants, and we hear all their customers. We're consumers. Our tastes change rapidly, and um, we're very picky. We spend our money in limited places, and we're, we're careful about what we do. Customers will want to define the camera angle, the lens type, product positions. Um, they will want to update the content constantly to keep things fresh. Um, as tastes change, we need to change with it. Um, everything we do needs to be repeatable, and it's needed now. The customers have to see every product they're choosing. They need to be able to visualize the edits they make because the products we deal with are custom. And they need everything to look the same when it arrives in their door as it does when they've seen it on site. Traditional solutions involve printing a sample, posting the sample, photographing, photoshopping that, then uploading. It was a long process, particularly printing, um, quite wasteful, you know, the problems with the environment. If you needed to make a change, perhaps you'd have to start again, go right the way back to the start. If you needed to do it for designs, the whole process would either be repeat, repeat, repeat of the whole thing, or you'd end up needing to kind of Photoshop and maybe be running Photoshop actions and things like that. Um, we decided, because of our specific problems of the volume of designs we have to do, we're talking 1,000 know, products, 100 designs, uh, different layouts within those. It was a massive, massive problem. So we chose to use Blender. The overall process we use um, won't be much different to anything else anyone else is, is doing. We start modeling, move to shading, rendering, and compositing. Rendering and compositing for us is quite a closely knitted pipeline. Um, we, they're, kind of, they're very, very closely linked, and we do it in a two-stage process. And we make extensive use of Blender's command line interface. Modeling, um, we will use the physical samples as a base. If any of the fulfillers are listening, um, apologies. We do rip everything apart the minute we get it. Um, 
we want to see how it's built. Uh, we have to measure things to the point where down to the millimeter or the tenth of the mill, depending on the size of the product, we will get everything down there. And we need to know where the printing starts, where the printing stops, exactly how it wraps around. We'll be working out the bevels and everything. We physically recreate everything the same within a Blender product. Um, while we're doing that, we do have to make variations. We'll keep everything as simple as we can. We like to keep things live where we can. Uh, we'll use modifiers and um, subdivs, are very popular ones for us. And if possible, we'll use pinning and drivers. We've got a system that works where if we pin, uh, we kind of put hooks in onto a single plane. We then have a separate Python script that runs. We just type in the data, the script runs. 40 canvases can be generated in 30 seconds by a computer and then sent off to render rather than you know, an hour or two for each person to make those changes. Um, UV mapping, um, you'll see here, these are the actual print requirements that need to go to the fulfiller. So our UV maps, we have to be very, very careful with how we do it. We have to meet the specification that's given to us by the fulfiller. Um, we can't rely on kind of automatic up out mapping. We kind of have to do it ourselves. Um, this canvas here, um, we can't have any stretching on there. I've said no stretching unless the products stretch. This is a purse that's um, it's a slightly neoprene purse. We actually have to kind of take into account how it will stretch and we want to show the customer how it will look to them once it's in the final state. And then the output we give may be in so that when it stretches, um, we keep everything as flexible and we try and maintain a balance all the way through because um, our products can vary so widely. Um, shading, uh, we will use a combination of procedural and image. Um, depending on the product, certain products we would use images, PBR based materials. Um, we usually will combine some kind of procedural element just because we don't want patterns to be looking repeatable. Um, we need things to say they look real. So we will be hacking in little variations as we go through just to keep the thing looking real. Um, cycles, EV, um, mostly depending on the product. Um, majority of the time we use cycles at this stage, though we will bake down to EV from cycles at certain points. We don't use color during this first stage. Um, I'll come more to that later. Uh, lightning and camera, we'll of course be using HDRI lights. Um, we'll set up a basic scene and then for this model here, we've actually didn't have quite the spotlights we wanted so we added in a little extra one to catch the reflection there. This is a sequined cushion. Um, we've added some extra lights here. Um, particle system was used extensively on this product. Every single one of these sequins is real. Um, on times we will put in extra objects for reflections. Uh, we're actually trying to model the, uh, the, the look and feel that people expect on a photo website, which can actually slightly differ from the 100% realistic model. We're working towards the expectation that the customer has when they look on a shelf. We all know that when we look in the shelves of a store on the internet, it's been photoshopped. Um, we're working towards the photoshopped photo of the real thing rather than the actual real thing. A lot of the time, it can be a, a quite careful balance. Um, We'll follow guidelines, so once we've set a guideline for a certain product, we'll make sure that all the products we do fit into that so that when they sit on the same page, everything looks the same and, and consistency. The rendering stage, um, we make extensive use of the OpenEXR multi-layer format. We turn on a whole bunch of extra layers over here um, and we split it up into a dual stage process. Uh, the first stage, We'll render things out with a grayscale, and um, we don't actually use any of the kind of target imagery that a customer would be taking. Um, so the main things we do are things like you know, family gifts, or there'll be designs around that. We wouldn't put any of the photos in in this stage, which is where we're rendering in cycles. Um, we keep it grayscale at this point, and as a couple of times, we try and strike a balance between the, the real view and the expected view. Um, Certain points will emphasize extra bits in the rendering. We may go back to the material, increase the bump maps so it looks a bit more bumpy in the final sizing. Um, we may need to reduce things because it's looking too bumpy, even though it looks exactly like the product. We're trying to make it so it matches what the people want it to sell as. Uh, compositing. Uh, this is a wonderful node setup uh, one of my team pulled out to us. Um, 
all the way through the compositing stage, we actually, what we, we start with is the original render that came from Cycles. Our first stage, uh, we'll kind of come through, we add two stages, uh, add the indirect and direct light, multiply by the color, and then begin to combine everything. At this point, we really are searching for optimizations. The sheer number of images that we create, uh, we actually use every trick we possibly can in the book to get the render stage down at this point. Uh, we won't be rendering any reflections. We'll just duplicate the model, flip it on the z-axis, and put it back in. We've stolen all the tricks we can from you know, games like Duke Nukem in the past. We're not doing things like putting in bump maps. We'll actually use composite in a bump map from the original EXR bake, and we'll just use a slight displacement. Um, at this point, we're not rendering any lighting in this stage. This is our sort of stage two. We'll actually use Blender internal. Um, we're probably the, one of the biggest users of that over a few years ago. Very sad to see it go, but Eevee has gotten quick enough that we're able to use it as a replacement. Um, I do still love Blender internal. Um, uh, once we've done those render stages, um, that's the point where we would begin to put the actual customer type photo in or a design that's been provided to us by someone in the, in the US or a UK designer. Um, we don't want to open Blender. As quick as it is opening it, we don't even want to do that. The volume works too much to allow it. So we actually use the command line interface at this point. Uh, we've got a set of bash, bash scripts originally. They were since replaced by Python scripts. Uh, the Python thing allowed us more flexibility, and we then since learned a lot doing the 3D optimizations. We were able to kind of go back and apply all of those learnings to uh, some of the 2D work we do. So we process things in 2D using Image Magic, OpenCV, and then the Python script will fire out and ask Blender to run the render, puts everything together in the correct folder structure that's needed, and then we process that and upload and, and build. These are what we call on-site shelf pages. Uh, these are basically examples of the kind of renders uh, we produce. Um, on the left here, this is our, one of our drinkware shelving uh, down the bottom. These are different uh, designs placed on the same product. Uh, upload your design is very popular. It's kind of a way for encouraging people to do their own, their own designing and upload those, and artists can start using the site. Um, but as you can see, we've got the exact same kind of main model, but with different images placed on them. Um, similarly, on this side, these are a slightly different type of model, not so kind of clean, and they're more fabric-y. Um, all of these renders in the final stage um, are not one-hour renders. They're not eight-hour renders, four days. We've done that work. At this stage, everything we're rendering is running in about 0.8 of a second, including the composite. Um, it allows us to deliver the volume we need. Um, it was actually so quick, what we were doing there, uh, allowed us to use it live on site. Um, Hot Rod is a service that we, uh, we named. Uh, we developed it while one of, the, one of the directors was in the States driving around in a hot rod. So we invented this crazy backronym just because he was in a hot rod at the time. <laughs> um, I think it's hyper-optimized threaded render on demand. Um, really shoehorned that in. Um, what happened there, though, was the customer would be on our website working in our builder stage. They would finish their product, and they'd click the preview button. We would render the exact output that would be going to the filler to actually print onto the item. Um, we then sent that to an instance of Blender running in the cloud, and uh, Blender would render that in 0.8 of a second, send it back to the customer, and they were able to see exactly the same kind of quality we were showing them when they were purchasing the item, they were able to see it in their previews. Um, we've since begun using the GLTF exports. Um, thank you so much to the Kronos group. Um, it's made life so much easier. Um, I spent many, many hours without GLTF years ago using the original 3JS format, and GLTF has made the whole pipeline so much easier. Um, absolutely brilliant. But we're now able to give customers a live preview where they can actually rotate the product, zoom in, you can see the bump mapping on the canvas, you can see reflections on um, shiny items like ceramic mugs. The reason we did this, um, these are, this on the right, are the kind of previews that you would have had in the past. Um, it's just like a, the image is actually just flat and then it's kind of composited on with an overlay just to show that 
you know, the idea is that the canvas would go around the, around the side. What we're now showing customers is these kind of things. So you can actually see that your image is bending around the outside of the canvas there. You're seeing all the bump maps on. Uh, the reason we're doing all of this and we've gone to all this effort is showing this dropping around the side of the canvas is massively important. If someone doesn't realize that they're doing that while they're creating the product, they get it in the mail. Um, everything we do is focused on kind of helping people to create and cherish memories. Um, if it's a photograph of a loved one, the last thing you want of that relative or the, you know, the relative you've just lost or your newborn baby, you don't want their eyes poking around the side of the canvas. You want them front and center. Um, all of this work is really now about visualizing that so the, the customer knows they need to put the image there. They can see exactly what they want. They get a better experience. We get fewer returns. There's less sort of re need to actually people breaking things, throwing stuff in the bin. That there are better. There's no bad reviews on the site saying, "Oh, I got this," and it just looks like absolute trash. Other uses: um, these images here, are what we call lifestyle images. Um, we use Blender to render these. These are actually done fully in cycles. We don't need to go to that full kind of uh, two-stage render process. We'll just do these in cycles. These are one-off ones that are used repeatedly on the site. Uh, we use these as kind of the one with the prints. We're showing a kind of real creative use of prints, giving parents maybe the idea that, oh, you know, you can cut these out as a fun activity with the kids on holidays and things like that. Um, really, we're selling the kind of the dream of home ownership and buying into that of you know making your house the perfect place and how photo is part of taking that feeling of turning a house and making it into a home and fitting photo in. Um, Google, we obviously do pay-per-click adverts. Um, we can actually resize any of these very, very quickly. We can set off a render um, that will just mean that we can put custom images in Google searches, tracking on a keyword. We can say, say a keyword comes through and someone's put in football. Um, we can put a football image in there and target there just to help kind of engage the user. Um, Search-wise, we've also used these for um, models for aug augmented reality purposes. GLTF format allows you to very quickly take something, display it on a phone, um, in a VR headset, anything like that. Results-wise, um, we have rendered over one million individual images over the past seven years. Um, we have 800 plus GLTF models being served on our website. Um, at Christmas, um, our peak season, the site, more than thanks to our system engineering teams and people like that that are making coded optimizations, we're going through 500 orders a minute um, in, the, in the States. We've created over 5,000 Blender files over the last few years. And at Christmas, we will be taking over $2 million a day in the US. What's next for us? Um, we are always looking for exciting new challenges. Um, my company are always looking for new technical partners. If anyone here happens to run a big supermarket on the level of Walmart, please do come and have a chat. My boss will fly out and take you to dinner somewhere very nice. Um, so we're looking, you know, there's things we can do. Fully 3D product cost customization is possible. This image here is just an AR one. Um, I took a picture just in my living room, put that on my phone, and it's perfectly possible for us to show customers the thing on their wall they can see that that 8x8 canvas is only this big. It's not going to fill up the space. They can also see that what they've ordered is way too big for their wall. Um, so there's options for kind of further increasing customer satisfaction, but also for upsell for businesses. Stuff we're not necessarily doing, but um, I do think is quite interesting that's out there with 3D work. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce this. The Michaela is a Brazilian influencer that is entirely generated in 3D software. Um, so much is happening in the world of 3D, and Blender is a big part of that. I believe the character is created in Blender, but they've got an influencer. And the same, the same benefits that we've used 3D technology for have applied there. Um, a robot or a 3D character is repeatable. It does not make mistakes. It does the same thing every time. Um, Contact-wise, uh, I'm around the rest of the day. I know there's not long left, but 
if you want to come and say hello, say hello. I am an absolute huge nerd. I will talk to you about anything nerdy you want. Um, I will also talk about work if you'd like to talk about that. And this is me on LinkedIn. Um, if you give me a shout on there, if you don't want to talk to the, anyone else at the company, I can put you in touch. Um, it's just a real sort of big, happy family. Um, I've got a great team, and we're always happy to talk and help. Uh, thank you.